Okay, it's uh, 5.15, so I guess I will uh, call the meeting to order. I didn't know if um, someone else was going to. But um, I'm Sandy Payette, and this is Mohammed Javed, and we are going to speak about a project at Cornell called uh, Scholars at Cornell. And the subtitle here is uh, Visualiz Visualizing the Scholarly Record, and the viz is kind of our little, um, kind of potentially, um, maybe a, a sticker or something could eventually come out of it. So um, this is the origin of this project. Um, had, it had its roots in the Cornell Vivo initiative. John Corson Reichert, um, the original founder of Vivo. Um, Cornell had the original instance of the Vivo um, full installation at Cornell. And we, over the years, uh, learned a lot at Cornell. I'm new to Cornell. Um, University Library again this year. I've, I had been there previously, um, as you know, at the Info Science uh, program and department, but now I'm at Cornell University Library. So I'm the director of uh, research IT for scholarship, and this project was kind of reconceived as um, how can we take Vivo at Cornell into the, the next generation of uh, what this space means. And so basically, in a nutshell, what we're talking about here from the, um, what we're delivering here, data, people, publications, and organizations uh, based on the Vivo ontology exposed as open link data. But we're focusing on this notion of the graph of knowledge. You know, Vivo is many things, and Vivo's been very successful um, and is now under the Dorospace, Dorospace umbrella. But we're trying to take a different twist on this um, at Cornell, and I'll explain why that is. So again, we're really focusing on what can the graph of knowledge, of the scholarly record essentially, what can it tell us? What kinds of latent um, knowledge exists in that graph? So you know, some of the common questions would be what are the hot research areas at Cornell University? What are the patterns of scholarly collaboration that the scholarly record itself can reveal for us? And who are experts in what areas? who are co-authors in which areas. And, and the Vivo project has done a lot of this over the years. Um, but we were turning our attention to visualizations where we really wanted to kind of explore how the uh, semantic knowledge base could meet with the dynamic um, web. So that's really going to be the focus of this talk. And the reason that we have reframed and refocused our Vivo work at Cornell is because since Vivo first came out, um, the, 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 the landscape is really exploding in terms of like people getting a piece of the game here. I mean, if you just look at, everyone's getting a piece of the action. And we have you know, the whole Elsevier Pure product. We have symplectic elements, which we are actually using and partnering with. You have all these other players, ResearchGate, Academia.edu. Many, many players are kind of entering the space of what you might call research information management systems. In fact, uh, Lorcan Dempsey noted this several years ago, observing this landscape and reflecting on where's the library's role in this emerging landscape. So that was the question that you know, Javed and I and the team really were get, setting out to answer, like what is the special thing that we at Cornell University Library can do in this space? So again, you know, we have all these players and we have to figure out how we position in this landscape. The other thing I recognize is this notion of research profiles. They're everywhere. I mean, I, there's like this proliferation of profiles. We started with Vivo profiles. There are orchard records, not technically profiles, but they're profiles, even though they're more data oriented. You have the pure, else if you have pure profiles, you have the Scopus profiles, the Mendeley profiles, the Symplectic Element profiles, the Open Scholar websites, the ResearchGate profiles, the NIH profiles. And you know, as a scholar, ah, where do you begin? You know, and I do wear two hats, because I'm, you know, I have my scholarly hat in uh, the Department of Communication at Cornell and my librarian hat. But it's like, where do you begin? And so the, the question is, how do, how do we start to observe this space that is kind of getting a bit unwieldy, and yet we're, we're talking about interoperability and linked data and knowledge emerging as this great knowledge network where everything flows and everything's interconnected. And this is, we have a lot of great work going on there, but we're just almost still pretty siloed in some ways with these research information management systems. So again, 
how to make sense of all this. Um, is this just the messiness of an emerging knowledge infrastructure? Um, emerging infrastructure is, by definition, as history will tell us, it can be very messy as different players enter the game and things settle down and there's redundancies and some winners and some losers. So yeah, I think it is exa an example of emerging scholarly knowledge infrastructure. Are these different players um, focusing more on an institutional perspective around faculty reporting and metrics, or are they focused on an outward um, knowledge for the public good, knowledge for everyone, open knowledge, um, proprietary versus open data, there's tensions there, commercial versus open source versus hybrid technology, so in the technology dimension of this, there are questions. And this notion of, our, you know, there's a tension between isolated systems and interconnected networks. And so, you know, where do we position? Well, definitely we're in the hybrid network kind of paradigm. Again, thinking of it as scholarly infrastructure. But, you know, really trying to think of the piece that we're doing, which is on the far right there, the scholars at Cornell um, service, which we're kind of conceiving of as more of a data and visualization service, unlike the traditional Vivo perspective. But we said, okay, we're in an ecosystem here and there are upstream data sources that have citations to the scholarly record, uh, Web of Science, Crossref, PubMed. Then you have um, a player like Symplectic with their Elements product where they basically, um, you know, have feeds for all of these different upstream sources. Then we also have institutional data in, you know, in play here. So basically what we bring to the, re to, the, to the table here with scholars is what we call the scholars feed machine, whereas basically through this system of systems, we will eventually get an automated stream of the scholarly record, okay? But that's not enough because there's tremendous amount of inaccuracies in the data, missing data, incomplete data, even coming from the supposed pure sources upstream, two layers up, and in the intermediary layer with a product like symplectic elements that you know, aggregates it all together. But it's still not clean, and it's incomplete. There are all kinds of anomalies. So we spent a tremendous amount of time working on a piece of code and algorithms that cleanse this data. And um, we try to push as much of the curation through an automated stage, but there's always more to be done where manual curation is necessary. So the big point here is the data quality is key to this. And so as the library, we say, what's our special sauce? Data quality, okay? So this, we can do something special in terms of getting a, a really best of the best kind of record of the scholarly record at Cornell, that is, you know? And we use a Vivo-based internal um, engine, basically. And, but then the other big piece that we contributed was um, how do you bring this data to life and answer real questions? and do it in an intuitive way. And that's gonna be the focus of our demo. So, you know, how do we motivate this project? Um, again, we're denying the messiness. We're, we're hanging in there and saying, no, we can tame the messiness. Uh, we're taking a public perspective on the data, unlike um, some of the Pure or Elsevier, you know, focusing more on the institution's needs for reporting and faculty evaluation. We're the library, that's not our role. Our role is knowledge. So we're taking this public perspective of Cornell's output, which is knowledge. We're taking an open, open data perspective. All of the data that we have will be made open uh, through open linked open data in other ways. We're taking a hybrid technology, which means approach, which means we're open to open source and commercial systems coming together to create the best architecture possible for what we want to achieve here. And we assume interconnected networks is the world we're playing in. So in summary, um, you know, we're kind of starting with, um, you know, a Vivo-based backend, taking advantage of the excellent Vivo model, the ontology, and we're building a fresh front-end experience on it with these D3 visualizations. And, you know, so basically it's like the best of both worlds is the proposition here where at the back end we have authority records, we ha can have inference, we have links to external knowledge sources, open access, and on the front end, you know, we're looking for as much as possible fresh looks and feels, data downloads, moving away from the kind of list views that you often see, they're all directories of faculty members, directories of institutions, uh, to a more dynamic interactive view. 
So with no further ado, I'm going to have Javid show you this because I think the, mo the most fun part about this is actually seeing the demo. So I would found an institution where any person can find instruction in any study. That's what Ezra Cornell said 150 years ago. And that's what Cornell is right now. Uh, we can find uh, domain experts in many fields. And if this is so, that means the scholarly contributions of these domain experts also vary significantly. They range from general articles, books, conference papers, to newsletters, scripts, reviews, performances, play, and so on. So scholars at Cornell's supreme, supreme goal is to um, record most of these scholarly contributions but for the start, we focus on the, uh, the easy ones, the publications. So I will give a, a small demo about um, from the, our main website. So let's go to the main website. So this is our uh, uh, main website, Scholars at Cornell. As Sandy mentioned, the, it's about research and scholarship across, uh, across Cornell. And if you look at current Vivo instances, you will see lists everywhere, uh, persons list, organizations list, articles list, grants list, all kinds of lists. And we want a list are good, are good uh, to browse the data, to, to navigate through the data. But uh, we want scholars at Cornell to be used to discover uh, some data as well. Finding a domain expert by a specific subject area or, or research interest. Finding a specific article um, based on a specific subject area with high global impact. Uh, discovering uh, ongoing research grants on a specific topic based on the investigators, based on the funding agencies. Uh, we're also using visualizations, uh, which not only help to navigate through the linked data, but they also are useful for um, uh, demonstrating the implicit knowledge, which you can't see in the list views. And all this data behind these visualizations is downloadable. So uh, we are working with specific uh, pilot partners at, uh, at Cornell right now. One of them is College of Engineering. So I will just go, I, I will just use this list view to go to College of Engineering's page. And uh, I'll select a specific department, uh, Biomedical Engineering. So in the right hand panel, you see the list, faculty list. You see the list of grant. But in the left hand panel, we call it this panel, uh, you see some visualizations. So these visualizations actually are emerged by our uh, continuous uh, discussions uh, with our pilot partners, what their needs are, what kind of information they want. And one of them was uh, to demonstrate the research interest of our faculty members. So we have this uh, person to subject area visualization for that specific department, if the networks, okay. So in the middle, you see the list of faculty members for that department. Across it is, across it is the subject areas. So there are two specific questions we have asked, we have uh, heard a number of times. What is the source of these subject areas? And how did you identify this person to subject area mapping? So to, the answer to the, the first question is that these are web of science subject areas for now. And to find the mapping, uh, faculty to uh, subject area mapping, that there are three different ways which I know you can do so. First of all is that a research a faculty member by himself and say, okay, these are my research interests. Second option too is that somebody curate this information for faculty members. I, have, I know some people at Cornell, they're doing it. They go to look at the websites of the department. They look at the profile pages. They look into the resumes of faculty members to find the research interest of a, of a faculty member. Option three is that let the data speak. Let the scholarly contribution data speak. And that's what we are doing over here. So Web of Science um, categorized the journals uh, based on this subject area category. And uh, all the articles which are published in that journal get the same classification. So what we say is that if the articles which are published in that journal get the same classification, can't we infer that the author of that article also have some research interest in the same area? And of course, these uh, subject areas are quite uh, broad, surgery, uh, physics, physiology, pathology, and so on. So you can, we can infer this information uh, from the data itself rather than um, focusing on a uh, manual or created uh, process. So if I hover over uh, the faculty members, you can see in which area uh, they are publishing. You click on that, you see a, a specific uh, faculty's view. You can also see, okay, who else is working on the same uh, subject area. You click on subject area, you see the subject area view and so on. 
The same visualization can also be seen as a subject area to person mapping. Okay, you can see who is, who is publishing in surgery. Maybe they are the potential collaborators. Uh, maybe already work together in a collaboration with each other. So if I, see, if, I, if I select oncology, I see, okay, there are five faculty members who have published in that area. And if you want to know a bit more about a faculty member, you can go further ahead. You have to get, take a one step deeper here. So if there's a link of the faculty page. I click there. I go to the faculty members page. Okay, so uh, Mr. King is a professor in biomedical engineering department. So in the, again, right hand side, we have the list of applications. But in the Viz panel, we have this keyword cloud. So in, normally in the articles, uh, there's a specific section called keywords. So we have aggregated those keywords together and present them in a, in a form of a keyword cloud. So it's not only a fancy visualization, but it helps in two ways. First of all, it can be seen as a fingerprints of a faculty member. You can see, okay, he's working on cancer, uh, circulating tumor cell, breast cancer, and so on. It can also be used as a, to filtering the articles of a specific uh, faculty member. For example, I can, I can see okay, what articles he has published on cancer. Click on that, you can see the list of the articles which he has published on that specific topic, okay, cell deformation, and so on. So, okay, now if I select one, any one of them, I, I can go to the articles page. So just moving from one page to another page and just navigating through the linked data. Okay, so on, on this articles page, I would like to show three main things. Okay, we have this author's list and the journal in which it is published, citation count, volume, published year, and so on. But we also, okay, so first of all, here is the, our traditional matrix, citation count. But if we, we also have this here, automatic donors to see web-based impact. And we have noticed here is that uh, the, as soon as the article is published, there's no citations which comes up very, very, very quickly. But that's, this automatic donors can show the web-based uh, web uh, impact of that article straight away. I've seen some articles which have like, um, which are uh, picked by 13 news outlets, but there's zero citation count. So a citation count is not the only metric you can uh, apply on a journal article and so on. We are part of library, so wherever possible, we also linked um, the journals to the library catalog page for the same journal. So a user can go and see, uh, see what uh, volumes and issues are available, and he can learn specific uh, issue. And uh, wherever, wherever we have the DOI, we have uh, this link here to the article page, the full text of the article. So somebody can go and get the full context of the article. Okay, so I'll go back now. So I showed you a department's page, per, a person's page, and article's page. So let's go back to a department level. No, maybe I'll, I'll just go to uh, college level. Okay. So another need which we had, uh, we have uh, listened a number of times from our partners was collaborations. Who is collaborating with whom? How often they collaborate? So we have these uh, two visualizations here interdepartmental collaborations, which shows how the departments within one same college are collaborating, and cross-unit collaboration. So we are at College of Engineering page, so engineering goes in the middle, and all the colleges around it, we can uh, see here. So if I click on Art and Sciences, now we're just drilling down within our same a specific college. So engineering to Art and Sciences, and now we have the faculty, uh, departments of Arts and Sciences. You can see, okay, who is publishing in that specific department. And then you can see the list of the faculty members who are publishing with collaboration with somebody else out of the College of Engineering. Click on that, you can see the output of that collaboration as well. So if we can just move one college to another college and you can see, okay, who is collaborating with whom and how often they collaborate and what is the output of the, that collaboration. One more thing, again, the data is downloadable. So all the data behind this visualization is downloadable. It's in JSON format, you just Take it and off you go. Okay, so let me go back to the home page. Come on. If, come on, okay. So we use this visualizations again, same thing like navigating through the link data and also showing different views, some uh, specialized views at department level, college level, person level. But we also uh, saw a need to show a Cornell wide view. So we also, have, we also have visualizations at the homepage level. One of them is the research grant visualization that shows all the grants uh, we have at Cornell. So it's a big data. And if you hover over, you see the title of the grant. Click on that, you see all the title, investigators, 
funding agency, and so on. But main thing over here is that you can filter it. You can just click here, say I need to, I need to see the um, grant from Specific Mary. Okay, and here you go. You see the, the grants somebody is working on. Similarly about the funding agencies. Okay, I want to see who is publishing, who is working with, uh, with, uh, in, the case, in the cancer domain. Okay, here are the grants from National Cancer Institute, NIH. And also we can also, um, of course, we can uh, also filter them based on the active years and so on. So you can just see the grants from the weekend. Okay, so now let's go back to the uh, slides. So I would like to highlight two specific things from this demo. One was the VizViewer, the front end. And other was the utilization, the back end thing, which you haven't seen because we all show the UI thing when the main thing is there. Okay, the first about is this VizViewer. So if you look at the uh, current Vivo uh, impl implementations, it's based on the Vivo ontology. And this ontology, this linked data, these are all the models to, they are all the technologies to model the data. They are back end things. But in current Vivo instances, the front end and back end is coupled very significantly. And in Scholars at Cornell, we are separating, separating them about, about till a certain, con, uh, context, a certain level, okay? And, and that's how we can use the dynamic web, web technologies like uh, Bootstrap, D3, Node.js, and so on. But again, one more thing is that we are turning data into a knowledge, okay? So if you look at the, this citation data, you can understand, okay, one, bar, um, one person who is, uh, uh, who is affiliated with a specific uh, department or organization, he has co-authored another uh, article with somebody else, and article is published in specific journal. But when you aggregate those citation data together, you can show some real good uh, knowledge there. Who is collaborating with whom? How often they collaborate? The fingerprints of a faculty member, the domain expertise, the research interests, and categorizing the research grants based on a specific subject area and so on. So that's what we're doing here. And second thing is utilization channel. So as Sandy mentioned, we are using elements as a backend thing to uh, record this, all the citation data. And elements goes on the web, harvest the data from different upstream sources and get the, get the data into elements. And in elements, you define, okay, one of them is my preferred source. For example, in, in this example is, is PubMed is my preferred source. So the next step is how you get the data out of elements and convert it into a linked open data. So if you use uh, the provided Harvester API from elements, you get only one viewpoint. They give you the citation data entry for your preferred source, and that's it. That's not enough for us. So what we do is that we uh, make this data and pass it through our utilization channel, okay? So all this data coming from Web of Science, PubMed, Microsoft, whatever sources that we have for a specific article, we merge them together into a specific, rec uh, one single record called Uber record. If that Uber record is clean and complete, it can go straight away into a, into a scholar at Cornell, convert it into an RDF. If it's not clean, then we have to make it clean, make it consistent, so we can use the creation bin. Now this creation bin can be used to clean the data, as well as it can also be used to add additional information on, this, on that specific thing. For example, we can add the ORCID IDs uh, for the authors. We can add the grid IDs for the organizations and so on. So in the end, we are giving, in scholars at Cornell, we are giving the best of the best uh, scholarly record. And that's what the way the value is actually. And we have, we have uh, in the future, we have planned is that if we push this uh, best of the best scholarly record back to the uh, uh, sympathetic elements. So now I'll just move back to Sandy, so Sandy will wrap up. So um, when we set out to do this, it's, um, it's really in February when we really started this, and we had a number of really key questions. Um, the biggest challenge we were facing at Cornell was that it is a highly decentralized university, and particularly around things like um, research management, um, Basically, every department has the right to choose what they want to do to manage their um, research information. Um, there's a bunch of departments using Activity Insight. There are a few of them that were actually using Vivo Raw, you know, using that as the data entry as if it were a full you know, research management information system. 
Pure has been on campus, uh, has not gotten traction yet, but uh, symplectic elements did, and so we actually are working with uh, the engineering, College of Engineering, the Johnson School of Management, which, you know, there's a prospect to have the whole College of Business um, in, involved, and uh, VET. So we have a set of pilot partners. So we really had to approach this as a pilot um, with those that wanted to go this path with us to see how much could we achieve through this you know, automated feed of the scholarly record. A lot of manual entry was going on in a lot of departments. And it was, it was really kind of a, to tame this was you know, um, kind of an overwhelming uh, university-wide initiative. The provost's office does not mandate a certain uh, system of record for a scholarly, um, for scholarly um, output. The uh, Office of Research doesn't either. So, I mean, the question was for us, can the library nudge a university-wide bottom-up coordinated process around managing faculty data, managing faculty citation data, grant data, faculty profiles? And so the, that's a question. It's still a question. Um, so we're trying to kind of create a system that is compelling enough that when we unveil these pilots over the next six months that pe more people will be like ready to come on board. The provost's office is now quite intrigued. A lot of uh, people are getting the word about this demo and what could be possible here. So this is an attempt to have the library do something that the library is not empowered to do to kind of try to get a coordinated response around managing research information. Um, but then you'd have to ask, well, what is the role of the library? What is the role of the academic units? What does the provost's office and the Office of Research think about this? And these are open questions. Probably I would say this is the classic um, socio-technical system as a, as a project where, you know, the socio, you know, part of this in terms of the people, the organizations, the culture, the politics, that is the big challenge here, okay? Um, less so the technology, because you know, we've been able to do some really cool stuff in a quick amount of time. Um, so data quality, this is the other issue here. Um, we took the stance of how much automation can, how far can we push it? How much quality can we infuse into this data through algorithmic means? And a fair amount. I mean, we, we really um, have done a lot of remediation of this data, you know, missing ISSNs, journal names that are, you know, messed up and all kinds of authorship problems. I mean, all kinds of duplicates. So we've done a lot, but there's still um, some records that uh, for the College of Engineering, for instance, um, I mean, we, we're in the hundreds of records that we have to have manual curation on which is good because it used to be in the thousands, you know, the high thousands. So we've been able to make um, real progress on this automated curation thing with the Uberization process, the Uber records. Um, again, this notion of uh, taking the fragments of the various upstream sources and pulling, you know, the one that has the best title, the one that has the best um, journal metadata, the one that has the most accurate author list, and kind of mashing it all together, and then doing some additional remediation by calling out to authorities in the process. So we've made some really good progress there. Um, another one of the challenges here in open questions is, you know, who is the user? I mean, we have many user stories here. Um, currently, we're engaging at the department chair university administration level. Um, there seems to be this real need where the questions they'll ask, you know, how many people have collaborated across, you know, the sciences and the social sciences around, you know, social entrepreneurship or, you know, things, questions like this. And they have to go kind of on a, you know, a hunt, you know, and gather together all this data manually. So they are really interested in the kinds of things that we can pull out of this knowledge network, this semantic network, and the visualizations um, making some of their job really easy, um, where it was formerly very manual. The university communications departments seem to love this. I don't, you know, it seems to have this kind of outward facing appeal, um, you know, of look at what Cornell's doing and you can interactively explore it. So it, interestingly enough, the departments of communication and outreach seem to like this. Um, not surprisingly, um, the faculty view this stuff as kind of a burden in a way, you know, these research management information systems, and they just as well would have administrators put the data in. 
However, faculty would love to have their websites fed by a clean data source. So when Javed said, every visualization we have, you can get the data through in you know, all the standard formats, JSON, RDF, XML, um, and even CSV, whatever. And we're gonna open up the number of formats with the idea that the you know, faculty websites could use this source um, as you know, a, a trusted source. And you know, again, this external view of um, prospective students and faculty that has always been something that Vivo has appealed, had an appeal for, people coming to who's in what departments at the university. But interestingly, we're seeing the most traction right now at this kind of higher administration level and communication uh, for you know, public views of what's happening at Cornell, you know, what's hot at Cornell. Um, and then the other main question is, what is the investment to um, sustain this? I mean, one of the big questions we have, and we're finally in a position, we just created a human curation tool. What does it take for a human to curate the bin? After all of the automated stuff is done, and there's still stuff that was kicked out as not appropriate quality, who's gonna curate the bin? Um, some people have indicated, um, the symplectic element people have indicated that a lot of libraries are actually stepping up in to that role of the data curator. But is that the department's role? Is it the library's role? Whose is it? How much effort is it? So really we're trying, you know, this month we're gonna do um, an, an experiment in terms of how much does it take to figure out what's wrong with a record or why it's a duplicate and to fix it and, you know, let it go into scholars. So, um, you know, these are the kinds of questions that we're working on. This is a Phase one, we just wrapped up phase one, which ran from February to the end of the year, and we're gonna do phase two um, with the idea that we will launch uh, this in July. So, um, to wrap it up, this uh, could not have been done without the work of an entire team, including our predecessors, which would be John Corson Reichert and Kathy Chang and several other people. Um, but to me, it's a great example of how many pieces of the puzzle need to be done really well at the back end, the front end, the human process, the coordinating with the vendor, coordinating with the departments. Um, so it really took a whole team to pull this off. And so we have a, a Twitter thing, um, but we also have um, kind of a virtual brochure. Uh, if you go to about.scholars.cornell.edu, there's kind of a video and uh, a few other things. And uh, you can actually, for a limited period of time, uh, we're opening up the, the demo instance, and here's the credentials, um, so you can play around with it. And uh, since we're still evolving it, we're gonna you know, leave this um, open for only a limited period of time, but then you know, people, of course, can contact us always. So um, I'll end there, and uh, we can take any questions that you have. <laughs>